Jesus and, and the blood that was shed on the cross. And that's the real uh, essence of the gospel, the good news that God has stepped into humanity and done for us what we haven't done for ourselves. But as well as God's grace, which is all of God's side, he's done all that he can do to save us, he asks us to respond to that grace as we understand it. And so we, we talk in terms of, of having to hear the gospel, because if you don't hear the gospel, you, would, you won't even be aware that the gospel exists. Uh, you won't possibly be aware to, to check your own lives and see, uh, I know this is a very popular word today, but sin is a, a biblical word. Uh, uh, we, we talk about being economical with truth. We don't really lie these days. Uh, but yet really, uh, the Bible says, uh, being economical with truth uh, is watering down the reality of we're telling lies at the end of the day. So, uh, unless we realize we need a savior, then we're not going to respond to the grace of God. He's going to all that trouble and allowing his son to die for us, uh, and it's meaningless to us if we don't see the need of salvation. Uh, John 3.16 talks about God so loving the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish. He saw us as perishing because we, we're digging holes for ourselves. We find ourselves some days where we, where we dug a hole so deep we can't get out by ourselves. It's only at that point that we'll recognize our need of the grace of God. And so God has stepped in and done all that. So we need to hear about that. That's good news. And therefore, uh, having heard it, uh, we've always got two choices. You know, when your children and your parents say, now don't do that because you're going to get in trouble, uh, guarantee what happens, we think, ah, what do they know? They're <laughs> all our parents, what do they know, okay? Uh, it's only five, six years later we we'll come back and say, do you remember what he said to me, don't do that? I wish I'd listened to you. I wish I had. Okay, but we, we as human beings, that's a, a tendency in our lives. Uh, we don't like to be told what to do. We don't like to be even advised in certain circumstances what to do. We want to make our own decisions, and sadly, we want to make our own mistakes. And it's only when we're up to rivals and, and, and trouble that we realize this is not the best idea. Oh, why not have to go down this route, okay? Uh, and, and so therefore we need to recognize sin is serious and its consequences. But God says, I can get you out of those consequences to a degree. I can at least deal with you spiritually and I can give you a new direction in life. Do we believe that? Uh, and we talk about this, this uh, thing here was, uh, there's a big debate in the religious world. Uh, at what point are our sins forgiven? Some people say, as long as you hear the gospel, as soon as you hear the gospel, your sins are forgiven, you're all right. Uh, but I think the Bible teaches a little bit more than that, because it's a package deal. Uh, and so we need to believe the message. It's our choice. Uh, we, we can accept or we can reject the message that we hear. And therefore our belief is super important. Because our belief isn't a, a mental assent. It's actually a call to action. No, if you believe, if you stick your finger uh, on, a, on, a, on a, an oven plate that is hot, all right, uh, somebody says, I believe that's hot, and you think, I, I don't think so, and I believe it's hot. Well, you're not going to say, oh, I believe it's hot, I, I, you're right, it's hot, it is hot. You're going to say, yow, I'm getting my fingers away from that. Okay, your belief that that is hot will motivate you to do something about it, okay? So that's a motivational thing. Belief is never static. It is something that brings us in action. It's always an active uh, concept. If we believe we're doing the right thing, we'll continue to do that right thing. If we believe we're doing the wrong thing, then it should motivate us to at least look for options that are, are different options. So belief in itself is, is never a static thing. It motivates us to the next step. And, and so we talk about the next step as being repentance. And this is where if we are sinners, if God does exist, and we believe that he has stepped into humanity in his son and, and done something for us that we couldn't do for ourselves in order for us to have the forgiveness of our sins. We want to turn back to that God. We want to, to do what is right, uh, 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 what that God wants, wants us to do, to sort out our lives, to change our lives. Paul, writing in a number of places, he challenges us. He says, we need to renew our minds. You know, if, if you recognize you're doing something wrong or you're in a bad situation, uh, the first thing you do is recognize that. So you, you hear about the situation, you, you know better than you're in this situation. So you believe in a wrong situation. He says the first step of getting out of that is by we need to change our thinking. Okay? Uh, before we used to think this is a good idea, now we need to get that point where we think this is a bad idea. Alright? 
and we need to want to do something about it. So we've done away from that, and that's all that the Bible calls that repentance. It's a turning around. It's a change from believing this was okay to, to now believing that's not so good after all. I need to do something different. So it's a mental change or a turn around. And then from that we have action. You put that uh, mental right. idea uh, into a practicality in your life. You look for options. How do I how do I draw closer to God? How do I deal with my sin? How do I live a different life? How do I change the situation I find myself in? And it's all part of the repentance package. It's all part of turning away from this and, and turning to God and, uh, and seeking his advice. And then uh, if we recognize that Jesus has done for us, like this, if we recognize that his blood has been shed on our behalf, then we can prepare when somebody comes along and says, you believe in Jesus? We say, yes, I do. I do believe in Jesus. And not like Peter at the fire, just after Jesus being uh, taken off to the question, and, and, and Peter's there by the fact a little, a little girl comes up and says, aren't you, aren't you one of his followers? Aren't you one of theirs? Not me, not me, not me. me. Oh, what, Peter, Peter, what's that going on? And yet the same Peter, 50 days later, he's standing in front of thousands of people and says, this Jesus, you crucified, what are you going to do about it? So a, a tremendous change took place in his life. But he was willing, at, at the fire, he wasn't willing to confess Christ. On the day of Pentecost, when 3,000 people became Christians, he was standing up and confessing. He believed that Jesus was the one who could make a difference in people's lives. And so we need to be at that point where we are prepared to confess that we believe that Jesus is the Christ. He has the answer to our problems. It's his blood that cleanses us from our sins. In our, in our baptism, we identify with that blood. We have our sins forgiven. We receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And we become new creatures. A new creature. All right, in mean, First Corinthians talks about a new creation in Christ Jesus. An opportunity to change things, to become new. Because we've got a different mental attitude and God is with us in and, in and through everything we do. So there's our challenge. In our baptism, we see a, an identification. Just as Jesus was uh, nailed to the cross, lifted up on the cross, uh, when they took him down, they buried him. They buried him in the grave. Uh, we identify with that. Jesus' death is our death to ourself. Jesus' burial is our burial in the water grave of baptism, identifying with what Jesus did in the grave. And Jesus' resurrection, we identify that. We come out of, out of the waters of baptism and you preach to Christ Jesus. Now, uh, it's not just washing the outside. There's nothing to do with that. It's not even nothing special in the water. It's our act of obedience to what God has asked us to do that makes this change, all right? But when we come up out of that water, God says, your sins are forgiven. And you look at yourself and you can't see any difference. There's no difference. There's no, no big plaque on the back of your back saying, this man is now uh, no longer a sinner. You won't see anything like that. There's nothing that comes up to your forehead and says, stop by God, what it is. <laughs> doesn't see like that. Uh, there's nothing. But what it is, it's all to do with the promises of God. This is what God says changes us, and, and as far as he's concerned, he takes our sin and removes it, he said, uh, uh, the Old Testament writer says, as far as the east is from the west. He says, I'm taking that sin and I'm going to bury it. You're not going to, you're not going to have anything to do with old sin anymore. That's the old man of sin, we're going to leave him behind. The only problem with the old man of sin is, you know, you go to the fair, uh, and uh, some of these fairground entertainments, you see this big, big uh, 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 table, and it's got little holes in it, doesn't it? Uh, and you get a hammer, and every sudden somebody pops up and you go whack, right? That's a bit like our sins, all right? We sometimes think once we're, once we're a new Christian person in Christ Jesus, that's it, we're never sinning again, we're never going to make any more mistakes, nothing else is going to wrong. And you, you, you just don't test the sun through. We're more like living with that, that fairground thing as a reality in our lives. God gives us a hammer, and he says, that's a bad one, whack him. All right? But as soon as we whack that one, we ah, I'll tell that. We pop it up and pop something. Whack that one as well. Okay? Our, the rest of our life is spent with a hammer in our hand, the hammer of God's word in our hands, that trying to deal with the sin that comes our way. Temptation comes at us from all directions. When you're outside of Christ, Satan's not worried about you. He's already got you. If you become a Christian, he thinks, hey, you're not getting away that easy. 
<laughs> I'm going to bring you down. And, and the sad thing is, a lot of people in the world, they see Christians as a threat. Because you believe that, and because I don't believe that, then I'm, I'm inferior to you. They see us as some sort of threat. And, and it's not that, that way at all. The only difference between sinners in the world and sinners in Christ is, sinners in Christ are saved by grace. Sinners in Christ of God dealing with their sin day by day. That's the, that's the major difference. The people in the world, they're stacking sin. It's like when, you, when, when you're a Christian, basically, you, you start off life at about the first, maybe, age about seven or eight, and, and, and God gives you a rock sack. And from that time on, everything that you do wrong, you throw in the rock sack. All right? So as you live your life, that rock sack gets bigger and heavier, and you're just carrying around all that old junk. Okay? When you're buried with Christ in baptism, when you come up with the words of baptism, you leave the rucksack back there. That's all the old stuff dealt with. And uh, First John comes around and says, the blood of Christ continues daily then to cleanse you from sin. You don't put that rucksack back on. Uh, does it mean you say you'll never sin again? Even Frank, I think you probably remember sinning once or twice. <laughs> uh, but you know, none of us are going to be perfect this side of heaven. All right. Thank so it doesn't mean to say, but the thing is, we've taken our rocks up off, and we're not going to try and fill it again. We're going to allow God to deal with that sin day on a day to day basis, and that's our relationship with God. That's what He does with us, and so we're made, made new again. So it's all to do with God's promises. It's nothing to do with us. It's all to do with God's promises and what <laughs> God says. My Son's blood can cleanse you from your past sin. My Son's blood can deal with your present sin. Paul writing in one letter, he talks about salvation. Salvation is a funny, it's a religious word, it's a funny kind of word. But it talks about being saved in a saved state. And it says being saved from our past sins. And then he talks about there's a, 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 a present salvation. And that's our daily walk with God, with, with Christ, where he deals with us on a daily basis. So we're saved in a present state. And then he talks about our future salvation. And that's where we enter into our eternal relationship with God for all eternity. All the old man's, uh, the, the old body is buried, left in the grave. But we continue to live on because we're bigger than the body, we're more than the body. And, and so he says, our future salvation. And so that's all involved in that. But it's all based on, is there a God? Is he trustworthy? Is he faithful? Can we believe what he promises? Can we believe what he says? And if we can, then that's a new life, a new relationship, it is in, it's all up for grabs. So we identify it with that. So the gospel reenacted, here's Jesus on the cross, and we're buried in his resurrection, and the other side, this side you have, we are on the cross. We, we, we say, God, I don't want to live like this anymore. I don't want to continue to sin like, I, like I've always been doing. I want a, a brand new start. Christian religion is one of the few religions in the world that, gives, that promises people a brand new start. That's what God's saying. In Christ Jesus, I want you to clean the old slate and I want you to start fresh each day. Uh, I, I told the story uh, before, I had a Bible study with a young lady, her and her husband, one night, uh, one night, a Sunday night, and she said, I'm going to work next week. She said, I'm going to the office. And he said, it's a, it's a quagmire in there. She said, we gossip about everybody. Uh, and in our Bible study, we were talking about gossip and its impact. Where you went, where I, I haven't killed in the rate, nobody, the character assassinated them, have you? And <laughs> uh, most of us have done that one time or another. All right? She says, I'm going to get in my office tomorrow and I'm going to not gossip. I'm going to make that my aim this next week. I am not going to gossip. I saw her the next Sunday night going to a Bible study, we just have a Bible study, and I said, How do you get on? She said, It's half past nine one morning. Half past nine as far as you got. <laughs> she said, she said, I was there. I was sitting there in the office half an hour and somebody came in and they said something and I just responded that uh, I stopped myself in track said, that's gossip, what am I doing? I said I wouldn't do that. You know, it's gonna be tough. But this, the key element is the Bible helps us to recognize our weaknesses, but also our strengths. And once you've recognized something, then you can begin to do something about it. If you can recognize your weaknesses, uh, dangerous places. I used to, uh, we, had a, we had an elder in the church one time uh, who was uh, uh, a recovering alcoholic. Uh, and uh, in the town we lived, there was, there was about 15 different pubs. 
And as he walked down the street, he would say, when I saw that cup coming up, and, and I knew my temptation, he said, I deliberately crossed over the street and, and walked, no matter how, how much traffic it was, I would cross over the street. I would keep as far away from that cup as possible. Because if I didn't, I'd, I'd be in there. So when we recognize our weaknesses, when we recognize our temptations, then that, that helps us, that's a different mindset to help us to try not to make the same mistakes again. Uh, when we find ourselves in the wrong crowd uh, and we, we, we're, we're being carried along with them, suddenly we say to ourselves, hey, this is, this is going the wrong direction. So you've got two choices. You can say, ah oh, well, it's only, it's only once, isn't it? Or you can say, I'm sorry lads, I can't go along with you anymore. I'm, 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 I've got to go off and do something else, okay? I just can't go with you today, all right? So you make a conscious effort, you recognize your enemy, and then you make a conscious uh, decision on how to deal with it, how to cope with it. And if, if you need to, you shout for your, your mate, hey, come and get me out of this, I'm in bad trouble here. All right, get around here quick. All right, so all that type of stuff comes in uh, in our reflection, in our reaction, in our giving ourselves to God. The, God gives us a, a spirit that helps us to recognize spiritual things uh, and help it to, uh, to be more aware of the, the temptations all around us. Though most of us, for most of us, we already know the temptations uh, come a little bit too well. But anyway, uh, so our relationship, we are placed in Christ. When a person becomes a Christian, you change your state. Uh, Colossian writer says, in Christ we have been translated out of the dominion of darkness, out of Satan's control, out of him always telling us what to do and where to go and, and, and what to get up to. And we've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son, into Christ. And in Christ's kingdom, Jesus helps us be aware of the minefields out there. He helps us be more aware of our own weaknesses and susceptibility to those minefields and, and guide us in a different direction. And, and so we have his help to be able to do that. And it's a relationship thing. We're coming to a relationship with God in Christ Jesus. It's like having an older brother. Uh, to uh, be able with us, uh, to be able to, to talk to about things. The, the beauty of, of, of God, if you like, if you drive it along, you're feeling rough, you can talk to God anywhere. If you're, if you're feeling potatoes <coughs> and you're having a bad day and you're thinking of bad things, you can talk to God. God, I'm having a mess the other day. Give us a hand, will you? And the very fact that you're talking to Him and, 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 and being aware of your, of your situation. Uh, he will enable you, he will help you, he will even empower you to be able to, to think that thing through and say, is this a good idea? Should I really want to go along this road or can I do something different? We can, we've got access to God any time. Okay? You don't need to pay a, a monthly contract. You don't need to take out, uh, you know, uh, buy a new phone every now and again. He's on call 24 hours a day. That's beautiful. You don't need to charge him in again. Uh, but anyway, so we're a new relationship. And, and that's because... From now on, we recognize that Jesus is dying for us. We all, we all need strong motivating uh, factors in our life, okay? Um, if, if, you, if, you, if your mother is, is going through a real hard time and, and you want to do something that's going to make her day, even if it's just a stupid thing like buying some flowers, okay? Any of you married people, that's always a good bonus, okay? Buy, buy a set of flowers, don't get you all sorts of trouble or even more. Or usually when you remember the flowers, you say, oh, what have you been up to? Okay, that's different. The, uh, you know, when you, when you love somebody, you want to do something for them. You want to, you want to uh, be there for them. And, and that's, uh, God loves us. And in our loving Him back, we want to do the right. We want to think the right things. We want to do the right things for those around us. And so we're raised to walk in new life, new thoughts. New actions, new direction, a different aspect. And he gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit to live within us, to encourage us and inspire us to do better things. So Peter says, repent, let everyone be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. Again, when you come up by the Lord's baptism, you don't see a, suddenly there's a, a halo on your head. Okay, oh, you get the Holy Spirit. Very nice. You won't see that, because it's a promise of God. It's not something that's visible, but it's something internal that God promises. And God keeps his promises, so therefore it's part of the deal. The other thing a lot of people in the religious world struggle with is baptism an option or a command. We, we as men can deny many things, but we'll never raise from the Bible the fact 
If a person wants to become a Christian, baptism is a command of Jesus. You say, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's a, it's a command that he says. So therefore it's essential. In all these passages, talk about it in different aspects. In, a, in a, it's that essence, there's no need for us to argue with God. And often that's the problem we have. We, we, we say, I know that's what you say, God, but we don't want to do that. Uh, you know, God's a big guy, you know, if you start arguing with him, he knows how you're made, how, what, uh, how you're made, he knows what's best for you. And again, it's like your parents, you know, sometimes, sometimes your parents know best, Some, sometimes they don't always know best, but sometimes your parents know best. And, 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 you know, we spend a lot of our time arguing with them, because that's not a good idea. Uh, and then, and as, you, as I say, years go by and then realize, you know, I wish I'd listened to you. Well, that's the same with God. Why, why do we want to contradict him in all he wants us to do? Because he wants to do for, for our best. Well, not be baptized, we don't believe it's necessary as commanded by Jesus Christ. It's important to note, baptism doesn't save alone. We had a, we had a, a lesson a couple of weeks ago talking about uh, faith alone uh, and grace alone. There's nothing in the Bible alone, okay? It's all packaged here. And, and we we were we reduced it by the time we asked, we said, your baptism, that's what saves you. Well, actually Peter says it saves you, but it's part of the package deal, okay? It's not alone. The same baptism alone uh, saves us, would be like saying faith alone saves us or events alone saves us. Neither would be what God says in his word. Our obedience to Jesus command to be baptized works with our belief. Uh, our repentance changes and the confession, the confession of faith saves us. Uh, all that works together by our salvation. But it's the blood of Christ at the end of the day that saves us, okay? Mm. The gospel, the good news, that's what the word gospel means, the good news, God has allowed his son to die for us and he was resurrected, he conquered death. And if he can do that, he's going to do the same for us. And so the gospel is to believe, be believed, the gospel is to be obeyed, and the gospel is to be preached, okay? The good news about Jesus, God wants everybody to know. Salvation is for anyone who accepts the gospel. Salvation is made available by God's grace. <coughs> it's an obedient, uh, it's obtained through man's obedience and a faith response. And salvation is a present day reality. We can accept uh, uh, the, the salvation in God's terms and we can be saved in that situation in Christ. <coughs> Lots of people have wrong ideas, again, about uh, what it means to please God. Uh, some people say, I don't need God because I'm, I'm so good, I, I, can, I can pull myself up by my own bootstraps. I can do enough that when I meet God, I'm going to say to God, God, I've done this, and I've done this, and I've done this. And I've done this. Uh, I'm just so good, you've got to let me into heaven. You know? I know it's your heaven, and I know you decided how to get in there, but uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm different. I'm, I'm an exception to the, the, the rule. It just doesn't work that way. In Islam, is based upon this idea of, of a balance. You know, if you've done so many good things, so outweigh so many bad things, and therefore you'll, you'll be okay. You'll be able to skin your, scrape it and skin your teeth. If you depend upon facing God by your goodness and the good things you've done, outweighing your badness and the bad things you've done, you might as well give up now. Mm -hmm. You might as well give up now because none of us are good enough. And that's just the way it is. But it's in Christ that we're saved. Some people say uh, that if they keep the Old Testament law, uh, if they keep a law system, uh, it, the, under the law, the Old Testament, uh, what really under the Old Testament is actually uh, what people put into the, the, the law. Uh, they talked about uh, giving a tenth of everything to God. And so that these uh, Pharisees would have gardens, and they'd have all sorts of herbs in their gardens. And would you believe they would go out one day and they'd pick the herbs and they'd say, ah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So nine for me, one for God. Right, one, two, three. They'd actually go through the herbs in the garden and, and, and make the distinction, those are ten are mine, and that one's for God. Am I good? I'll give him that one for God. What happens if you, if, you, if you drop them and pick them up and you lose your place? You know, you're only going to be wrong if you have, you, you, have, have you really given everything you need to God? Have you missed one? Short if you short change, God, yeah. Uh, I mean, how many times are you going to be wrong uh, before you're going to be wrong? Okay? How many, times, how many times do we steal 
and, and, and before somebody could turn around and say, hey, stop, thief. Goodness, you know they do it once in your in a snooker because that's, you know, that's the way it goes. Uh, so if we break the law, then we break the law. And if we depend on our law keeping to make us right with God, we might have to give up. That's why Jesus died. He says, you can't do it. I've got to do it for you. Your, your death's not good enough for you to get into heaven. My death is going to be good enough to get into heaven. And so the Bible talks about, instead of being clothed with our righteousness, not that, again, biblical word, it just means uh, our good works. How many people do we talk to on a daily basis? If we talk about them, are you a good person or are you a bad person? There are some people out there who say, I'm a good person, and they, they wouldn't even, you could point out as much, well, actually, there's an easy way around it, isn't there? If you talk to somebody who says, I'm a good person, I'm not a bad person, all you do is ask them how you're the wife. Okay? They'll, they'll give you a list about five, five pages long within two minutes, all right? Nobody is good, perfectly good. We all mess up. And it doesn't take very long to see through that. So if we depend on our goodness to get us to heaven, it's just not going to work. We need to depend upon Jesus. So, uh, some people say, I, I, I go to meet my brothers and sisters in at, 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 at a church on Sunday morning, at worship on Sunday morning, uh, because it's my duty. You know, I've got to do that. Uh, that's not your motivation for getting together with God on Sunday morning. Well, it's not because uh, we have to, it's because we want to. I go to meet my, my brothers and sisters, I feel thankfulness. We are in the same boat, we're all sinners together, we're working to, uh, to, to, to grasp hold of God in a better way day by day. And I need your help, and you need my help. So it's a working together, it's a teamwork, it keeps us going, and it will help us to be the best that we can be. Uh, some people say, well, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to become a Christian because I don't want to go to hell. I'm scared of death of hell. Well, that's not, that's not really the reason why you should. I mean, some of us, it's interesting. You know different people, all right? There's some people, if you give them a sweetie, you can do anything. Give them an apple pie, they're yours for life, all right? <laughs> There's other people, you can hit them with a stick before they'll do anything, okay? There's some people, some of us need a bit of coercion before we'll do the right thing. And others just did their kindness before we do the right thing. We're all different. And so uh, uh, God says, I want you to love me. But before he says that, he says, I love you. Do we believe that? If we really believe that God loves us, then it makes it easier for us to love him. Because he loved us first. And everything that God does, he shows us the example. He doesn't ask us to do stuff that he hasn't already done. And Jesus, that's the beauty of Jesus. Jesus shows what God's capable of. Uh, what about, I still feel guilty because I sinned. Well, you will do. That's natural. If you're doing something wrong, well, it's not a bad. There's an element, okay, that when you get into a certain degree, when you're doing something wrong, it, it's meaningless. If you've ever, ever watched the cowboy programs and they, they, they're branding the cows with a brand on them, Okay, they take a hot iron and put it in the fire and bring it out and it's stuck into the hide of the cow. You can stick a, a knife in that after they've been there. You can stick pins in that cow all day and the cow will not feel a thing. Because you've seared, you've seared the, the, uh, uh, the flesh with a hot iron. Nerves. Yeah, burnt up with the nerves. Uh, a person who's got um, uh, the bits with a bit full of um, leprosy. Okay? They, they can be cooking sausages and they can be cooking their fingers at the same time because they won't be able to feel a thing. And the answer are gone. All right? Uh, sometimes that's how we feel about when we do things wrong. We are so used to doing the wrong thing that we don't feel anything anymore. And so there's no twinge of conscience. No, sure, you, should they beat this old lady over the head? Yeah, why not? You know, it's, it's crazy, isn't it? But sometimes we can get to that point. That's feeling, isn't it, Ray? That's right. Well, That's you, we, 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 sometimes, we sometimes do it ourselves, and sometimes things happen to us in our life that, that cut off the feeling. We, we almost divorce ourselves from our real self. And so therefore, that's not me doing that. Well, it is me doing that. I don't feel it because, you know, that's not me. <laughs> you know, uh, it's my other, other half or whatever. <laughs> uh, so there's an element where uh, some people struggle when they become Christians. When they do something wrong, they think, oh, what, you know, what, what are we going to do? I've done something wrong. And, and God says, I know, I was watching it. Mm -hmm. But my blood, son's blood, 
uh, will continue to cleanse you. Because A, you recognize it's wrong, and B, you don't want to do it anymore. If you struggle with something, God's on your side saying, go for it, you can, you can overcome this. It's when you stop struggling, it's when you give in to it, when it just becomes a, a common everyday occurrence and you don't even think twice about it, then you're in trouble. So when you become a Christian, your life isn't going to become perfect overnight. You're not going to stop doing loads of stuff that you, you, you've been accustomed to doing up that point, but you will grow. There's a lot of stuff I no longer do than I used to do. And that's what's called growth. And, and, and <coughs> Peter comes around and says, if you're not growing, there's something wrong with you. So there's an element of, of progression and, and, and not, okay? So we will still feel guilty, but at the same time, because we recognize who God is, and we, because we recognize that he has a capability to deal with our sin, and we trust in his forgiveness, we can come into a, a knowledge that that's not going to cripple us. Well, we sometimes, uh, Satan's pretty good. He, he uses two major weapons. One is fear and one is death. Uh, the death one, okay, we'll leave for the moment. But fear, Satan uses fear to cripple us. All right? I, do, I won't do that because they might say something. I, I won't do that because I might fail. And sadly, we end up not doing something because our fear cripples us. And that's tragic. And God, God says, my love, perfect love, casts out fear. <clears throat> it helps us to cope with each day as a brand new day, with new opportunities and new challenges. And it changes our thinking about stuff. So we no longer are debilitated, we're no longer uh, held back, if you like, from, from all those things, our potential, what we can do, because we conquer, God, God's love helps us to conquer that fear. We trust in his forgiveness. Do we really? That's a real crucial thing in becoming a Christian. Do we really trust God and his promises? Will his son really forgive me? Will his son's blood really cleanse me from sin? Will his son's blood really help me to be a different kind of person? Do we believe him? Do we trust him? Are we willing to put our life in a line for him? That's good news rather than bad news. The purpose of God's grace is to offer us a way of escape from the ultimate consequences of our sin. Now, there's a, a, a distinction between God's forgiveness and the consequences and man's forgiveness and the consequences. No, if, if you go out and you beat up a little old lady, okay, and then you become a Christian, God can, can forgive you for that. But the, the police might still come around and nick you and put you in prison for a while because you beat up a little old lady. There's consequences. So there can be consequences that our relationship with God doesn't change, but there are other consequences that God can deal with. And so we may still have to pay a physical price, but we may we'll achieve a, a spiritual uh, release from that, because God's forgiveness. And that makes a huge difference on how we deal with things. The purpose of our belief is to direct us to faithful obedience to God, uh, accepting Jesus and the Holy Spirit. The purpose of our repentance is to turn us to Jesus Christ and his teaching, turn away from our sinful activity of the past and try and stay away from him in the future. The purpose of our confession is to show that we were not and are not ashamed of who Jesus Christ is and our trust, our belief in him. The purpose of our baptism is the final act of our obedience and response to God's grace so that we might be in that saved relationship. It saves us through symbolic contact with Jesus' blood because that's what God promised to do. 1 Peter 3, 21, uh, uh, we are washed uh, in our well, baptism saves. Uh, there's other passages here that as well. The result of our forgiveness of sins, the gift of the indwelling spirit, and God <coughs> adds us automatically to his body, the church. Okay? You don't join the church. God adds you to his body, whatever in the world that is, it's the church. Okay? So we, um, we are added automatically. And it's that from which we rise to walk a new life. Different challenges, different direction, different vision, different um, motivation for doing stuff. Prepared to live faithfully until our death. That doesn't mean to say live perfectly. I wish it did. But it doesn't mean that. It means we're going to try each day. Each day I'll do 
a golden deed by helping those who are in need. Okay? So we're going to be thinking differently and striving to live differently until the day we die to serve Christ. When we look at the religious world today, there seems to be so many conflicting answers to questions and so much confusion that we get lost in the, in the whole miasma of it all, the whole chaos of it all. The work of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God is to help us figure out our way through the maze. Okay? And it is a maze. All right? uh, I think the last count was 1,200 religious groups, uh, what we call Christian religious groups, uh, in our world today. You know? where, where do you start? How, how, do you, how do you figure out the, the wheat from the chaff? Where do, you, where do you get your direction from? The real key element is it's the work of the Holy Spirit. Well, how does the Holy Spirit work? In, in the book of John, Jesus said he was going to die, he was going to leave the apostles, but he wasn't going to leave them helpless. He was going to leave them uh, with a guide. And he talked about the Holy Spirit being a guide. And he said, the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. Okay? Then the apostles got that truth written down, and in our New Testament, in our Bible, our Bible split up in the Old Testament and New Testament. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit has written down how to become a Christian, how to live as a Christian, what the goals of a Christian are, is, and, and, and how to serve God to the best of our ability. He goes through a whole bunch of problems. You know, we think in our day and age things are bad, all right? Uh, and we think that in the first century, 2,000 years ago, when the first became Christians, they had no problems. They don't have the problems we had. That's rubbish. Read first Corinthians, see what it's like, okay? It's a mess. These were Christians who were struggling. They'd come out of all sorts of different backgrounds and they carried with them into their Christianity a load of those old ways of thinking and old ways of doing things. And Paul had to help them time after time to understand, hey, that's not a good idea. You don't go down that route. This is the way you should be going. And so the New Testament is our guide to help us to deal with some of the challenges and the problems we face. And that's the job of the Holy Spirit. He enables us through the Word of God to see what's right, to see what's true, to see the direction we need to go in. And I know it's not going to be easy, okay, because it's, it's, it's a lot of stuff in there. But uh, we can, if we stick at it, we'll get the big picture, and then we'll slowly define all the, all the rest of the stuff. So the, what uh, the Hebrew writer says, the Holy Spirit, the Word, the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. He says it's able to it's able to make a difference between all those these things uh, that we need to make a difference in. That's my transition. That's the one man. That's the one man. I was going to go down that butcher's route, but that's okay. It's it's true. Uh, so it means basically it's the knife so sharp that you can do stuff with it you wouldn't do normally do with other instruments, okay? Uh, and so uh, the word of God is the word uh, Paul writes in Ephesians says Put on the whole armor of God. And there's a lot of good stuff in there that, that guides us to give us information to go along with. So how does the Holy Spirit work? The problem we have is, we've all got, okay, I, I know there's different translations because language changes, okay, but basically we should have all have access to the New Testament. That's the Word of God, okay? Everything else that man produces, even, even a PowerPoint presentation we believe, isn't inspired. But the Word of God claims to be inspired. So we need, if we want to get the right direction, we need to get back and read the book. It's all in the book, okay? Uh, and it's just trying to figure all that out and, and make it some sense out of it. Life's manual? Hey? Life's manual? Life's manual, that's what it is. It, it really is. It, it's a tough one, but it, you know, it, it'll get us there. And so, the Holy Spirit... But the thing is, if we start adding in other stuff, uh, other bad-made stuff, one of the biggest problems in the religious world today is, Instead of going back to the Bible, they go back to the creeds, the confessions of all ages and every time. And what that does, instead of bringing us all together into one uh, harmonious group, it splits us apart. I, I can't do that because it's not in the Catechism. I can't do that because it's not in the 39 Articles. I can't do that because it's not in... What's all that about? Let's get back to the Bible. Yeah, I think of all because of private main Galatians, yep. chapter 1, verse 10, yeah. from I now seek the approval of man or of God. Or am I trying to please man? If I was still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. That's right, that's a good, that's a good passage. You spent, if you go back a couple of verses before that, uh, he talks about, well, yeah, you, you Galatians, what does that smile you? you? You're going away from the gospel. There is no different gospel. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's a good passage. 
Uh, so, uh, bear with me in this last slide, uh, because it's a bit controversial, all right? But the idea is the same idea, okay? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. It, the Holy Spirit's job is to guide us through the Word and help us to get back to God. Now, if the Bible says, Luke in, uh, it says, the, the seed is the Word of God. If you plant an acorn, you're going to get tomatoes, right? Right. Oh? Yeah. Oh, why not? You're going to get an acorn tree. You're, well, you're going to get an acorn tree. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, you know, if you, if, you plant, if you plant something, you expect to get something different. Uh, the same, same thing back out in the older version where you plant it. And if somebody else comes out, you think, well, that's going on there. If somebody's got it wrong, okay? So, God says the, the, the Bible is the, the seed. It's the Word of God. If we plant that, it should grow Christians. It should just grow one people in harmony with God and in harmony with one another at the end of the day. The, the, the crucifixion really is, is God reaching down to man. And if we can get God right, then we can start to sort out problems with our fellow man. Okay? It should make it easier for us to deal with one another. But we've got to get him right first. And so therefore we need to follow uh, the Bible, the Word of God. So, if you look at just the Bible alone, uh, including some of my PowerPoints, by the way, oh no, the Bible <laughs> alone, alright, we should end up with a Christian. If you plant the Bible, if you plant the seed of the Word of God in people's hearts and, and lives, you should end up with the same end product that they ended up with 2,000 years ago. We need to go back 2,000 years. So let's get back to what Peter said in Jerusalem, alright? And, and the, the book of history, book of Acts, and, and New Testament. Mm -hmm. Now the problem we have in the religious world is, we have, for example, the Bible and the Methodist discipline. Now that produces Methodists, because that's their rule book. So the Bible plus the rule book. Mm -hmm. The Church of England's got the 39 articles. The Roman Catholics have got the Catechism. And also, obviously, it's updated all the time by, by the Pope in Rome. Uh, the Bible and uh, the Baptists have got what's called the Baptist Manual. And the Book of Mormon produces Mormons. And, and the Doctrine and Covenants and Pearl of Great Price. Well, you can throw them in as well, yeah. I mean, they, they were, actually, the they turn around says the Book of Mormon is because so many other religions <coughs> took so much out of the Book of Mormon, uh, the Bible, we need the Book of Mormon to replace all that back in. But of course, the problem is, a lot of what they believe is in fact in the Book of Mormon. So they had to write another two books, the Pell of Great Price and the uh, no, Doctrine no, no, no. of Covenants, because that's where the rest of the stuff that they believe comes from. Yeah. So they, they initially basically reject the Bible. So at the end of the day, when we look at the religious world, what is it that keeps us apart? Is it God? Is it the Holy Spirit? Is it Jesus? Is it the Bible? Mm -hmm. Or is it all these other things that we, the creeds, then we go back to to say, this is what I believe and why I believe it. But what does the Bible say? Well, the creeds say, all right? So who is your authority in your religion? And, and our challenge as individuals, because it's a short life we're going to live. We need to get back and say, what did, what did God say about this? What did, what did Peter say about it? What did Paul say about it? What did John say about it in the New Testament? And let that be our guide. Let that be our authority in our religion. Okay? So that uh, wraps that up for us. There's a company called Snap On Tools. If you buy a screwdriver from them, they give you a lifetime guarantee. Now, the first time I came across Snap On Tools, I was a relatively young man, about 25, 26, and I bought a Snap On screwdriver. When I was about 40, 40 odd, I broke it. I actually ran over it to be honest, but I broke it, okay? Uh, and and uh, I, I knew the manager of Snap On and I said, I broke this and, and he gave me a new 25, well, 20 odd years after I had purchased my screwdriver, he gave me a brand new one free. Because that's what they say. It's a lifetime guarantee. No, just my it's a lifetime with a screwdriver. Uh, and, and my lifetime as a, as a customer. Now, you can pop down to the pound shop and you can buy a screwdriver. It looks exactly the same as a snap-on screwdriver. In most days, and it's a really difficult screw, uh, it will do most of the things a snap-on screwdriver will do. But whatever you do with it, uh, at the end of the day, if you break your 
that one screwdriver, they had to replace it free because they promised a lifetime guarantee. If you go to the pound shop and go back with a screwdriver and say, this doesn't work anymore, they'll say, oh, buy a new one. All right? Because that's what, you know, what do you expect for a pound? That's what they're going to say. What are you going to expect for a pound? All right? In the realms of religion, Jesus promises us an afterlife time guarantee. If we listen to him and we follow his commandments, and he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, then you'll get what he promises. Many religious groups make exactly the same claims of promising you, if you follow me on a Mormon, if you follow me, not only not only you will get one lifetime, I can give you loads of lifetimes. I mean, I knew you could lose lifetime. Uh, and if I'm a Mormon, I'll promise you loads of wives. Well, I don't know about that, because the mother-in-law is coming along with them. I don't really quite fancy that. <laughs> so it's also, you know, they promise you all sorts of stuff. Why? Because that's part of the teaching program, okay? The choice is yours at the end of the day. Many, many groups make what sounds like group claims. But when you examine the fine print of the teaching, they often ignore and often contradict the teaching of Jesus. And that's the real key. And we've seen that, hopefully, uh, as we've developed through these, some of these lessons, okay? And, and I'm not being nasty or whatever, it's just one of those things. If we get back to the book, we'll produce Christians. If we ignore the book, or, or say that, I, I remember talking to a lady about baptism years ago in Glasgow, uh, and she said, that's not in my Bible. She said, what do you mean it's not in your Bible? She said, no, it's in my Bible. I said, it must be in your Bible. Let's have a look. So she took a Bible that wasn't, she ripped out the page, half page is gone. That just a word. Anyway, okay. At the end of the day, that's a real question. Who are you going to trust? Are you going to trust God? Are you going to trust me? Are you going to trust anybody else? Or are you going to get good enough with the Word of God? You can read it for yourself, understand it for yourself, apply it to your own life and have your own relationship with God. <laughs> it's no good you stand in front of God and say, well, Graham said he's part of it. Who's Graham? Okay, what? <laughs> what did the Bible say? What did I, what did I say to my son? Okay. <laughs> the, in Acts chapter 17, it talks about the Bereans. It's a group of people, Paul, uh, Paul came along preaching the gospel, and it said the Bereans were more righteous than the Thessalonians. Why? Because they checked what Paul said. Right? <clears throat> they investigated. That sounds good, but is it real? Does it work? Is it factual? So they checked for themselves, and they were classed as more righteous because they did their own investigation into what was being said. When I teach a class, okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, there should be 11 of you, okay, 12, uh, there should be 12 of you saying, does that sound right? Is that what my Bible says? <coughs> okay? And, and you need to... When I get before heaven, religion, Christianity is a sort of religion, alright? <coughs> I want to get to heaven. I don't care about you. <laughs> well, I do actually, because the very fact that I want to get to heaven, I want to bring others with me. Okay? So that's a, that's a different deal. But it's selfish. I want to be there. And if I can be there, I would hope I would encourage you and enable you to, to also be there, alright? But you're responsible for what you believe. You're responsible for your relationship with God. You're not, I'm not responsible, I'm responsible to teach. And actually the Bible says, if I teach the wrong, I'm a greater condemnation. Okay? It's, it's, uh, I, if you don't want to be a teacher, I'll save you a lot of hassle in the last day. Because uh, if you are a teacher, there's greater condemnation you get it wrong. And I, in my religious life, and we'll finish off with this, I've talked to many people and in many religious groups. I've sat in their homes and I've listened to them do all sorts of stuff and tell me all sorts of stuff. And it saddens me sometimes when they say to me, I know that's what the Bible says, but that's tragic. They're teaching people something that they know is not right. And yet they're happy. This book, I, I came across something the other day, all right, uh, I'm always looking for translations and stuff that help me understand it better. One of the group translations in time past was a group called, it's called the Amplified Bible. So I, I paid $20 because I had to get it off the, the original companies in America. Uh, and I thought that'd be useful, you know, it, it helps you look through different parts of text and stuff like that. 
And, and I went to Acts chapter 2, as you do, okay, if you, you know, as you do. Um, and it says, uh, Peter said, repent and be baptized because you have the sins forgiven. <laughs> because, I mean because, because there's a word in there, it's for, F-O-R. In the Greek it's translated E-I-S, it's called ice, okay? And when you look at a Greek lexicon and all these other things, it says, with a view to. So, it should read, in an easy version, it should, see, it should read something like this. It should read, he that believes and is baptized for, leading to the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. It should be forward. Yeah. Is that the word, is that where you get the of Jesus on to put into? Uh, it's a similar thing, in, into, it's a proposition of movement, a preposition of movement. The okay. Greek text it's, it's is, proposition the Greek text is, ace of faith and the martyrdom, for, with a view to receiving the remission of sins. Okay. And I thought, this, this Bible was updated in 2015, and I'm, going to, I'm in the process of writing a pleasant letter, <laughs> <laughs> because there's thousands of people who believe that that's a Bible translation. And the guy who originally proposed this idea of that the word ice could be could be translated because of, he admitted when he trans he was a Greek scholar, he admitted when he translated it, this is not what the text says, but we could do it this because I don't believe that baptism is for the forgiveness of sin. So I'm going to stick because of in there. He went off to university and taught a whole bunch of people, and a couple of people came out of that, and they wrote a Greek lexicon which is supposed to be something that helps you to understand the Greek language. And they followed their teacher in that. But when he was lecturing, another bunch of Greek scholars came along and said to him, that's, the way you're using that ice, it's just not there. You can't do that with ice. And they actually, they, had a, 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 they were all the same religious group, and this, uh, these other guys actually said, if you want to be a proper Greek scholar, you need to translate the Greek as it is. They can't mess about with a text like that. And they told them off for it. <laughs> And yet, on the internet, and in this Bible I bought just this last week, you've got people still repeating the same mistake this guy made 50, 60 years ago. He'd been dead for 50, 60 years. Mm -hmm. But his method is, is uh, translation of each I'm going to write to them and I said, you need to change your name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is not the Amplified Bible, which implies a translation. This is the Amplified Commentary, which anybody can, anybody can write a commentary. That's not a problem. But if you're claiming to speak on behalf of what the Greek actually teaches to help people like me and, and, and other people get a hang of, of what the Greek's all about, I said, you've got a, a responsibility to be honest with the text. Yeah. So I've got to let a half written in a moment. I'm letting the, the, the steam slowly you know, <laughs> sink off it a little bit before I, uh, I finish off. But anyway, that just shows what you're up against. <laughs> Even a tra Bible translation doesn't get it right. And that's sad for us today. Professor Bruce told me personally yeah. That the man who said that came to the passage with his mind already made up. He, in ice, he brought it into the passage instead of ex yeah, ice. Ice. Yeah. Cool, okay. yeah. Which is tragic. I mean, because what, what chance have we got? These are great scholars. These are supposed yeah. to be our, our guides. They're supposed to be the guys that help us understand the text. And if they can get that so wrong, mm -hmm. that's tragic for all the people who don't know what the text really means. Which is, anyway, I've dropped them all. Uh, Johnny, please, the word of practice. Gracious God, David Father, 